The Windsor Pumpkin Regatta is an event held annually in Nova Scotia, Canada, where participants hollow out giant pumpkins to use as boats and row themselves down an 800 meter course. It's equal parts wholesome and crafty, making it the perfect sort of on-brand event for Martha Stewart to attend and be among her fans. So, in 2005, she planned on doing exactly that. Things didn't go according to plan, though. Martha was unable to make it to the event on time because Canadian Customs had denied her entry into their country. The reason? Martha Stewart is a convicted felon. It's the Christmas season 2001, and Martha Stewart is taking what's presumably a well-earned vacation in Mexico. She's the CEO of Martha Stewart Omnimedia, a lifestyle brand conglomerate that she grew from infancy to being a publicly traded company whose IPO made her the world's first female self-made billionaire. Her plane stops in Texas, where she's able to check in with her assistant who relays a message to her. Quote, Peter Bakanovic thinks Imclone is going to start trading downward. Martha holds nearly 4,000 shares of Imclone, and so she calls Bekanovic at Merrill Lynch. His assistant, Douglas Faniel, answers and, as instructed by Bekanovic, tells her that Sam Waxel's daughter and father have been unloading shares, millions of dollars worth. Peter thinks she should sell, and Martha consents, and they unload all of her shares at a price of about $58. Why was this information so critical? because Sam Waxel is the CEO of Imclone, whose cancer drug Herbitux was expected to receive either approval or rejection from the FDA soon. If the Waxels were selling, the news couldn't be good. And it wasn't. The news was made public on December 28th, and when shares opened for trading on the 31st, they had fallen to around $46. By dumping on the tip, Martha saved herself $45,673. Of course, everything that happened there was completely illegal, and everyone involved should have known this. Waxell is the CEO of a publicly traded company, Bekanovic and Faniel are stockbrokers, and Martha Stewart is both. She's the CEO of Martha Stewart Omnimedia, but she was also formerly a stockbroker. In the 60s and 70s, for six years, she worked at a firm called Moness, Williams, and Seidel. So obviously, Sam Waxell immediately comes under investigation. And it turns out he's been committing all sorts of crimes. Besides the insider trading, he's not paying taxes on expensive artwork he bought. He pledged warrants as collateral with a bank, even though he no longer owned them. And even back in the 80s, he was forging signatures of other officers on official company documents. And another thing Sam Waxel was doing in the 80s, dating Alexis Stewart, Martha's only child. So how did Alexis Stewart, 22 at the time, end up dating 40-year-old Waxel? She was introduced by a college buddy of hers named Peter Bakanovic. After college, Bakanovic goes to work at Imcone with Waxel. Eventually, he leaves and becomes a broker at Merrill Lynch. And while there, he brings on both Waxel and Martha as clients. Investigators begin connecting the dots, and on June 6, 2002, the House Energy and Commerce Committee announced it's looking into Stewart's stock sale. MSO slips the next day, but only a little. The street doesn't seem to totally believe it. This is Martha Stewart, after all. She sells a cookbook that's just 175 different cupcake ideas. She's not a criminal. So she mounts her defense. Martha says that it was just a happy coincidence, or an unhappy one. Her and Bakanovic had recently arranged a stop loss for Imcon shares if the price fell below 60. The problem was that there was no record of this anywhere outside of a number 60 written on the margin of some documents held at Merrill Lynch and people were pretty sure that someone just wrote that in after the fact. The flimsy defense puts additional pressure on MSO shares, and both companies continue to fall. Things only go from bad to worse on October 2nd, when Douglas Faneuil takes a deal, effectively turning on Martha and his former boss. He's going to say there was no stop loss. Shares of MSO sinked around $7 from the pre-scandal price of 17 and after saving about 50000 by acting on the tip she got, the value of Martha Stewart's holdings in her own company have decreased by over $150 million. Waxel's case is clear-cut, and he gets nailed. 
He's guilty of a variety of charges and sentenced to seven years. Stewart's is a little more complicated, and in the end, she isn't even charged with insider trading. Instead, District Attorney James Comey, yes, that one, charges her with conspiracy, making false statements, obstruction of justice, and securities fraud. Martha beats the security fraud charge, but on March 5th, 2004, is found guilty of everything else. She's sentenced to five months in prison. So we all know what happened after that. With her brand destroyed, America's first self-made female billionaire becomes a cautionary tale. Her company limps on for a little, then fades away entirely. And Imclone does the same. Tragically, now tainted in the eyes of the SEC as well as the FDA, Herbitux is left to wither on the vine, dealing untold collateral damage to cancer patients throughout the country. Except, that's not what happened at all. The popular narrative was that the scandal would be damaging to Martha, and Martha was the company. This is what happened at first. In the company's earning report issued post-indictment, revenue dropped in every division of the company. The Washington Post cited a Florida marketing professor in case there was any doubt about what was happening, saying, quote, people loved, past tense, Martha Stewart. If it has Martha's name on it, they're having trouble selling it. Sharon Patrick, the CEO who replaced Martha, seemed to concur, commenting, quote, we are moving from a personality-based business to a brand label-based business. Also, their problem was twofold. Not only were the charges damaging, but the trial itself dealt a blow to Martha's image. There was a scandal about how she hated telephone hold music and berated Faneuil about it. Martha was apparently not only a criminal, but worse, a mean person. Adding insult to injury, Inclone resubmitted the drug to the FDA, and mere months after Martha's conviction, not only was Herbitux approved, but Inclone's share price was higher than her selling point. So, whoops. So, things weren't exactly going her way, but then Martha made a brilliant move. She decided to begin serving her prison sentence, even though the appeals process was ongoing. In doing so, she guaranteed she would not be just another rich person who got away with something. She was going to serve her time just like anyone else. Having completed the fall, the rehabilitation of Martha's image started almost immediately. From her new home at FPC Alderson in West Virginia, Martha was able to send updates to a website and her friends relayed stories from going to see her. She foraged dandelions in the yard to add greens to her meals, she did yoga in the visiting room, and in short, she did very Martha Stewart things. Plus. Now she had thoughts about sentencing guidelines. People love a redemption story and they were eating this one up. Gallup polling showed that Martha's approval rating bounced back as though nothing had ever happened. Plus, an overwhelming number of people believe that the incident would help rather than hurt her career. And in a perfect instance of perception becoming reality, Martha Stewart Omnimedia's stock price skyrocketed. Shares reached multi-year highs just as her prison sentence was about to end. The company responded to the data they were getting and suddenly changed their tune about not being a personality-based business. New CEO Susan Lin declared that Martha, quote, always has been and remains our greatest asset. So she made it, right? Not really. For a final twist in a story that's full of them, it turned out that people were right about Martha but wrong about everything else. The share prices reached while Martha was in prison would never be reached again. Martha Stewart the person immediately became host of The Apprentice, but that didn't change the fact that Martha Stewart Omnimedia relied heavily on magazine sales for revenue, or worse, had merchandising deals with a murderer's row of retailers starring Kmart, Macy's, and JCPenney. The company started losing when Martha went to prison, and it didn't stop until mercifully in 2015 it was bought out by sequential brand for $6.15 per share. That's all for this moment in stock history. Thanks for watching, guys.